Hi, and welcome to another episode of the State Security Series. And today I'm um, joined by Farida Shahid. Farida, welcome. Thank you, Joe. So happy to be here. Great. I, I would love to start by just asking a little bit um, about how you actually got into cybersecurity. I'd love to hear the path that you took to get into the industry and, you know, and what you're doing now. So I first got into there by, honestly, it was my major in college. So I was in information technology. It was extremely boring. So my father said, hey, there's something called cybersecurity. It's not really new, but the concept in terms of having a degree and it being widely known is new. You're a Muslim woman, you're black. It's going to be like something where you're not going to have a lot of representation, but you'd be someone that would bring a lot to the field. So I researched it for four months. I changed my major. And then shortly after that, I opted out of college. So, <laughs> and I got an internship at corporate. And that was what I got like the real, real world experience with cybersecurity. And I did threat intelligence. I did cybersecurity awareness. I love cybersecurity awareness the most. And then I realized that, you know what, I need to create impact. So I created a business. <laughs> awesome. T tell me a little bit about your business. What do you do now? So I help parents protect their kids online. I'm always talking to them about online gaming, social media, general internet. So I take my own habit of being an avid gamer to help them understand the gaming industry or just the world in general and protect their kids while they're at it. That's awesome. That's a, a really cool thing to do, very powerful. And, you know, that kind of uh, works well with the next question. You know, over the last year or so, um, you know, everyone's been scrambling to work remotely. We're finding children at home, you know, spending more time on, on computer and things like that. Um, but when it comes to this, this virtual workforce, you know, what advice could you give people that are trying to secure their remote workforce as of now? I would say start with the basics, start what matters the most. So that means your computer, that means your internet. So understanding to change your passwords, to have a password manager, to look at your settings every time you open up an account and just being extremely vigilant with scams or fraud or emails. So like phishing attacks, because those are the common ways that you're going to get targeted by a hacker. Yeah, hundred percent. And we're seeing so many more reports, so many, you know, news articles that are coming out where, where this is, this is happening, you know, the data is backing it up. And I think, you know, the virtual workforce isn't, it's never going to go away now. It's going to be here to stay. There'll probably be some sort of hybrid uh, approach where people will be in the office part of the week, whatever it may be. But this is going to really impact people's security programs moving forward. Um, how does that future look for you when it comes to security programs? So I'm, I'm loving the new future. Honestly, I think we keep on saying we want to go back to normal. And I'm like, well, was normal good? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm actually very, very much happy about the future, happy about remote work, hybrid work for different people. And I think really the biggest thing is understanding that the people are the most important aspect of it and making sure there's a lot more resources to explain security that makes sense because we always say, oh, we've been talking about security for years, but we haven't been talking about it in a way that people can understand, that they can grasp, they can actually implement. So my mission moving forward as the world is changing is to be a part of the movement where we're simplifying security in a way that everyone can understand. Because simple is genius. People that can take something and make it simple and break it down into steps are the best. So yes, we're gonna see like a change in technology and a change of the way that we're operating in security, but I'm so, so interested in how we're going to transform education and transform how we connect to people because we've been very disconnected in the security world. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. And you know, the shift, it's moving quicker all the time and it's always been a challenge to keep up, um, but actually now everyone has to, you know, be proactive. They have to, they have to keep up. They have to plan ahead because things are changing. So yeah, I know. I really, really like that insight. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to talk about security and compliance. You know, they're often spoke about in the same breath as if they are, you know, the same, the two two sides of the same coin. But in reality, they're not really. Uh, but you know, what ways, in your experience, can security and compliance teams actually? work together to create a, a winning alliance? So this is something that's really interesting. I honestly do not work so much into the compliance area. <laughs> but what I would say is since I work with different teams that have completely different, they have the same overall goal, but their day-to-day -day life looks completely different in the workspace. So I would say making time to update people, 
about exactly what you're doing in the team so that everyone understands what's the main goal that you're working towards versus everyone having a completely different goal and then you're not you know checking up with each other so definitely meeting regularly about what's happening what are the successes what are the projects that i've seen and whatever work i'm doing has worked yeah communication is key it doesn't matter if it's a great or compliance or other areas of the organization if people aren't talking then they're going to miss things they're not going to be aligned you know mistakes are going to happen so yeah i think it's really really important um, you mentioned earlier about you know phishing attacks and things like that uh, but you know based on your experience and insights how are cyber attacks changing at the moment you know, phishing isn't new uh, ransomware isn't new um you know different styles and different approaches are, are coming in uh, you know, different challenges uh, are facing different companies at the moment. But what, in your opinion, are the biggest threats that companies really should be focusing on right now? I mean, we're seeing ransomware change. <laughs> we're seeing the way the data breach operates change. Honestly, I believe that there needs to be a huge focus on how do we operate together in a world that seems like it's a bit apart, especially since we're remote. So what I would like to see is um, more focus on the new things that are coming about. So when I'm working with parents and children, there are a lot of attacks that go into places we don't think about. So most recently, there was something with Steam where if you're downloading a gaming link, so someone would say, hey, like, here's a game invite. And when people click on that, that would download malware or that would download a virus. So for me, it's looking at unconventional ways that hackers try to get into your computer that can affect your remote work environment that we don't think about. Because we're so used to, oh, if I log into... Outlook or Gmail, I might get a phishing email, but we forget that that could be a WhatsApp link, that could be a Facebook link, obviously LinkedIn, that's a huge thing. People are looking for jobs remotely. So these hackers are like, how can I create a profile to get more information about someone who is in a higher rank or how can I get more information from your social media? So we have been treating social media, at least as the general consumers, as like, oh, maybe someone may, might get information from there, but we forget that is a prime way that your work environment, your children, and yourself can be affected. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you know, these, these criminals are creative, whether we like it or not, we're always behind them. They're always coming up with new ways. You know, you, people become more aware of phishing attacks, so then they switch and they go through different, uh, different mediums and have a different focus. So. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. And I guess, you know, being in the industry that you work in uh, with children and gaming and things like that, you must have seen, um, you know, some really, really clever attack methods. Are there any that you could elaborate on a little bit more detail? Yeah, definitely. So what, there's a couple of ways that they try to get you. I would say as a security person, they would make like fake security websites or fake vulnerability websites, or they know that we're, you know, constantly checking the news to see what's out there, what are the new... Um, attack methods. So I've seen that happen in, like in our end, or they will send you a message about maybe some opportunity for security, but it's actually a hacker trying to get you to click something. And those are ways that we let our guards down as a security person. And then as a gamer, you're in the middle of the game and someone's like, hey, can you check this out? Or here is a game build that you can do. And they'll send you a link. And then sometimes it is just on social media in general with kids where they'll just share their passwords with other people that's not really normally like a hacker that's normally <laughs> like another person who wants it and then they lose it but i've seen yeah. some really clever ways in terms of building a relationship with people that's the best way to describe it where they've gotten comfortable so the first email or the first message does not give you a link it's not really weird or out of place they're just trying to get to know you they have the fake whatever set up and then once you respond to that and you build a relationship then they'll kind of, they'll send you an article, hey, you might want to look at this and it looks completely fine. And so that's when things start to happen. So I've, I've seen it like in games, but also in social media is a big one. Yeah, wow, yeah, that's, uh, that's really interesting and, and really scary, obviously. Um, you know, and, and it goes back to that communication thing as well, you know, building that trust where you can talk to your children about these different um, threats that people will, will be facing. Um, so I think it's really important. It's great to hear, you know, the work you're doing around that. Thank you. Um, one of the big issues as well for a lot of companies is, um, you know, investment and, you know, getting buy-in from, you know, different people, different stakeholders, uh, C-level and things like that. You know, what advice and what tips could you share uh, for CISOs when it comes to communicating almost like a return on investment on, on security um, to, the, to different stakeholders? How do they get buy-in? Oh my gosh, that's one of the hardest, a billion dollar question, right? <laughs> and honestly, There's no right or wrong answer. <laughs> right, right. 
because we focus so much on the technology, but we don't realize that the people who need to either fund that technology or approve it being you know, used within the company, they don't understand what you're doing. So they don't know, okay, the security team this, needs this type of budget or this type of funding. So having someone who is maybe even it's a designated job where that person is like the translator, where maybe both talking, you know, speaking English, but the technology world, the security world, even there are certain space like application security. That is not, my, I don't know what's happening with application security in terms of the deep down under code of it. So I'm going to need someone to translate it to me in my language. So when you're talking to a stakeholder that needs to know certain information or you need them to act on something, to break down things in simple words um, and investing in communication strategies, effective. Because we always say like communication is key, but that's not, we're, all, we're always communicating. But are we communicating effectively? So I definitely would invest in someone who's a trained professional in making sure that you're 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 getting your your pitch or your ask correctly so that another person can understand what you're asking and then developing a really great relationship with them so they know that you know what this person they actually you know we we can, we can vibe so when people like each other they're more likely to sit down and decide okay let me let me see what your problem is let's see how we can come up with a solution it's it's my answer to a lot of different things but like man <laughs> it's so it makes important. sense yeah. No, it's really solid advice. It's definitely, definitely the right advice what people need to be uh, leaning towards. No, I appreciate that. Um, uh, last question here was um, talking about new security programs. So if you were going to an organization and you were going to try and help them rejuvenate a program or even build a new security program, you know, what three or four areas would you tell organizations to specifically focus on? So in terms of what I do with security awareness, I would say to engage with the people that you are trying to educate, because oftentimes we have this view of, okay, the humans are the weakest link, let's put on X, Y, and Z program to do security awareness training, but you're not actually engaging with your target audience. You're, you have the consumer who's gonna consume the product, but if you don't know what the, how the consumer communicates or what their struggles are or their understanding about security and safety, you kind of lose them. And honestly, really to develop, so basically doing like a Q&A or a survey or, you know, visit different departments to see what they're struggling with, what are the communication language and have different ways to go about that. So maybe the security training could be the annual thing, but you know that you have different events, different games, different ways to communicate security to them in a way that you're engaging, you know, with them. Honestly, because I feel like we, we create things, but we don't actually realize the audience that we're talking to, what they like. So I would say to focus less on what you're supposed to do and focus on, okay, what is the end goal? And then how can we get to that end goal, even if it's unconventional? Maybe it is, you know, a video series with like some funny memes or things from, you know, um, Marvel or something, right? To drive home a point. And so we do see some security platforms of security awareness do that, but really honing it in and realizing that it is okay to let loose and allow security to be something that is not necessarily fun, but edutainment. Yeah. <laughs> Education no, and entertainment. A, yeah, it's a good point. It's a good point. And uh, I, I think that is a challenge, isn't it? To get people engaged, uh, to get them to take it seriously. When you work in the industry, you do take it seriously. Obviously, you know, you surround you, you live and breathe it, but for... For people that don't, that is a huge challenge. So yeah, no, it's, it's some really good points you make there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that was the end of the, the longer questions. Now I've just got some rapid fire questions. So I, I don't really want you to think too hard about these, if possible, and just give short answers. Yeah. Um, so we'll go, okay, start from the top. So what cybersecurity newsletter do you read on a regular basis? Who? Curbs on security, or Krebs on security. I can't remember how you pronounce it. <laughs> Yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, okay, and what one cybersecurity account should everyone be following on Twitter? Dr. Jessica Barker. Excellent, I love her. good choice. <laughs> um, okay, in your opinion, what was the one data breach that really made the industry sit up and pay attention? Mm, the industry as in the security industry or people? I Maybe mean, yeah. I'm thinking too it's much. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, take it as you like. It could be the cybersecurity industry, or you could talk about um, you know people in general. Probably OPM. Probably that data breach was probably big. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of them, and there's more and more. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's a, a difficult lot. question. But the, it's hard to pick one, one out, definitely. Like, people are like, oh, yeah, that's a lot of information. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that gets people talking. So, yeah, good choice. Um, you know, we hear things like buzzword bingo, uh, loads of random cybersecurity terms that are often misused out there. In your opinion, what's the most misused cybersecurity term? Cybersecurity. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. <laughs> can, you, can you elaborate on that? I know it's rapid fire questions, but I'd love to hear why. Well, because people, when you say cybersecurity to normal people, it, it, that makes it feel like that has nothing to do with them. It makes it feel like it's a corporate thing and not a personal thing, so they don't change their security habits. Okay, yeah, I like that. Interesting. Um, you know, I know we're all remote at the moment, and no one particularly enjoys the virtual events that much, but in your opinion, what's the best conference that people can attend? Mm, best conference, a best type of conference, or like an actual thing? <laughs> Overall, if you want to go off topic and go slightly different, like what type of conference, that's fine. Or if there's a particular conference um, that stands out to you, some like one that you go to on a, on a regular basis or maybe where you've met the most connection, something like that. Any conference that you can connect with people instead of just blindly just listening. I like connection, so networking. Yeah, yeah, I know a lot of people like the B-side conferences because they're small, they're localized, and obviously they're a great opportunity to network. So exactly makes sense. Uh, who's your biggest inspiration in the industry? Mm, since I mentioned Dr. Jess before, I would say Jane Franklin. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and if you could give people one bit of advice to help improve their personal digital security, what would it be? Take one step at a time and you got this. It's better to be 70% secure than 0% secure. Yeah, good advice. Uh, your best cybersecurity book? Best cybersecurity book. Actually, I think I have it. Confident Security by Dr. Jessica Barker. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and this is the last question, uh, the most relevant one. Pineapple on a pizza, is that okay? Yes, and anyone who doesn't like it, I can't talk to you. I would say pineapple, chicken, and you have to have olive oil. If you don't put olive oil on your pizza, extra virgin, cold-pressed olive oil, you also can't talk to me. I mean, you can. You can, link, you can do a LinkedIn <laughs> message, but we may not be that close. <laughs> All jokes. Excellent. So you're not only a cybersecurity expert, you're a pizza expert, too. Love that. Yes. yes. <laughs> olive oil. <laughs> Brilliant. Right, that's all, that's all the questions I had today. Uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, it's been great chatting to you. And uh, yeah, we'll talk again soon. Thank you, Joe. This is awesome. Thank you.